Okay, very good. So, um, good evening, good afternoon, and good morning to everybody. Um, this is the panel about uh, the machine learning achievements and trends for the World Artificial Intelligence uh, Conference 2021. Uh, my name is uh, Corrado Vicata. I'll be the moderator for this panel. And I have uh, five distinguished experts uh, of the industry which have been invited to participate in uh, this uh, panel. Uh, our discussion will take about um, an hour, uh, during which uh, I will invite all the experts to present their present uh, um, achievements and uh, activities. And of course, I would like to hear from, uh, from each of you uh, an insight uh, and uh, some insights and some, uh, some visions of where you see that uh, the machine learning applications and the artificial intelligence applications in the heavy industry uh, or the industry in general uh, are going to. So um, I wish to invite now Mr. Lorenzo Croce, who is the CEO of uh, Solano in Germany. Um, to, to start with the introduction and, uh, and the presentation about the, the activities of uh, this company. Please, Lorenz. Okay, thanks. So I will start now. I hope you can see it. Well, yeah, we just to Alora. My name is Lorenzo Croce. As uh, Corrado said, I'm the manager of uh, Celano GMBAs. I'm originally an electrical engineer, but I make my whole life with software development, probably computer and neuroinformatics. So I started my first optimization in IE uh, works in 94. And since 2002, I'm the managing director of Celano, and we still work in the same part of RE machine learning and MES. So if you look what we are doing here in the heavy industry, we, have, we cover every part of steel and in every part of that we have application where we use this IE algorithm to handle this and to optimize the, the, the most projects. And we have a special way how we start. We call it a, a generic three-stage concept with integrating this IE. Because we always say the first step, if you have a link between the process models and um, the, the, we need to observe, we have the observer part of the part where we cook the current state, then we predict some possible futures, which where we do, and then we start the IE where we are, or the ML, where we make the optimization and that's a part. And looking at the system, that's what how we work and that's how we think that implementing IE or machine learning algorithm works. So look at the process, predict it, and then use it. And if we see, for example, at this main part, the generic optimization tool, if we use this part, it then don't depend if you need this IE for a furnace model, whereas one of our main focus, because we, we came from an old uh, furnace supplier, and um, we, we have a wide experience in this part, and there we use also our algorithm. Oh, if you lose it for a material flow, for example, and it makes to, to optimize the plant part. And also if you use it for circular value creations, like we use it also in that part. So you have the same focus on this part to handle this, and that is where, where our experience looks. We think using IE machine learning in the heavy industry, but not only there, you need you you need to use the, the the smart algorithm, but the first step is just keep in mind you have to know how the process is model, how is the process, and the third step. If you couldn't integrate this to to a reliable software framework, you will not get the production and pro, product quality and efficiency what you need. And that's what our main focus is: how we use IE or machine learning in the heavy industry. We always try to implement it in a combined focus where we have these three parts together. And that's it. Thank you very much, Ryan, for very, very, very spot on, uh, very, very uh, clear and uh, sharp. So uh, please now, Mr. Mr. Charles Yap is the CEO of uh, King Robotics, and he will introduce himself and his activity. Hi everybody, I'm CEO and co-founder of uh, Clean Robotics. My name is Charles Yap. My background is in social entrepreneurship. So I get involved in organizations that have uh, double and triple bottom lines. 
profit motive, social bottom line, environmental bottom line. And what we're building at Clean Robotics is a product called TrashBot that uses artificial intelligence, robotics, and computer vision to detect waste as you throw it away. And it robotically sorts landfill waste from recyclables, from compost, or indeed any three or four streams more accurately than the public. And the problem that we're solving with our technology is really human confusion. People don't know where to put their items of waste at the point of disposal. And when they make mistakes at that level, it causes contamination everywhere else down the value chain uh, for solid waste management. And the cheap problem associated with that is that then you can't sell contaminated recyclables and commodities on the open market. Uh, and so I'll just show you kind of a quick video of how it works. This is our trash bot standard. You approach it like you would any other waste receptacle. You deposit your item of waste. At that point, the artificial intelligence and robotic system will detect and categorize that waste and then uh, sort it into the appropriate place. What's interesting about our technology is you know, we are obviously a decentralized system, uh, uh, but it has broad reaching implications for the recycling uh, commodity and solid waste industry uh, by capturing data uh, and providing traceability in a way that isn't possible currently. And it also, uh, you know, obviously improves the quality and the quantity of materials that are eligible to be recovered. That's it. Thank you so much, Josh. Also very, very, um, very, very clear and the streamlined introduction. Uh, I will invite now Mr. Jason Jason from uh, Daniel Industrial Automation. He's the he's the general manager in uh, in China, and uh, he will introduce us to the activities of uh, Daniel, who is a big player in uh, the metallurgy industry and what they're doing in in the field of machine learning. Please, Jason. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. My name is Jason. And the general manager of Dalini Industry Automation, Suzhou uh, company. Okay, our company is located, our location is in Suzhou City, China, and our revenue is 55 million euro. And our employees, 82, 82 people in China, and uh, our industry area is a metallurgical industry. And our mother company is Dalini Automation, and Italy is founded in 1969. Okay, just a brief information. So we also a lot of achievement for this machine learning. I just give some examples. It's kind of like an automatic scraper clarification. This is using the computer vision to identify and classify the scrap steel to replace new manual clarification, which can give customers a lot of benefit of 15 million euro if you buy 1 million tons scrap steel with 3% 3, 3 impurity tolerance example. This is a really a, a hit or uh, help support customers to resolve their pain a pain point. This is very um, unbelievable product, and it's very popular in China market now. Another one is we call QMelt. It's a digital technology of EF, which can permit adaptive process control during all stage of EF production and generate a fingerprint of process to support the end users to optimize the process and save OPEX. Roughly, I can we compare to the traditional one, we will be safe more than a five to 10% depends on different process. Another one we call Q3 premiers is quality predictions. It's also based on IoT platform and also data driven data driven service. All of the three, these three products we use several different uh, machine learning uh, technologies. And I think it will be a, also a future uh, for metal, uh, metallurgical industries. Okay. This I should give a very, very short examples and we can discuss later if we have some interest. Okay, let's see. Thank you, Jason. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, please, Miko, um, it's your turn now to introduce uh, your activities. Miko is uh, a senior advisor to the board of Advian, which, uh, which is a company um, which is uh, developing a lot of AI for uh, heavy industry application. Miko will, uh, will lead us into, into their activities. Please, Miko. Okay, hello, can you see my, my screen at the moment? Yes, we can. Yes, yes. Yes, Mick yes, Marcio. Okay. Yes. Uh, digital uh, experience since 1999, so a bit over 20 years. Over 30 uh, business operations related to digital software and, and for years to artificial intelligence, machine learning, and all, over 100 portfolio of data-driven digital and IoT solutions. Latest, I was uh, an, uh, 
I was employed by ABB in a senior position. And uh, now, like I said, that I'm I'm uh, I'm same time a board member, but I as well help this Advian company as senior advisor, where that uh, how, for example, at the moment we have 15 cases in heavy industries that how how to utilize machine learning, artificial intelligence for the betterment of of the business. Uh, I think sort of as an expert panel, there was a, this is just a summary before a few of the examples that what I have seen in over 100 cases that how much there has been too much focus on sort of islands of connectivity and intelligence that there are too few equipment too sort of a two motors and drives and these are sort of attached to artificial intelligence machine learning where I see that the major benefits are that when when you are from from the system to production level to value chain op, uh, op, optimization level and I'm really fond of at the moment how this added IoT intelligence that how you add sort of a light technology to your operations and what type of in, uh, insights you are able to get and these are just out of these 15 examples uh, cases these are two examples as so simple is that how you have a uh, mining operations automated drone based stockpile inventory solution for a mining company so how to get near real time inventory of stockpile volumes uh, for uh, monitoring the uh, mining process and for a traditional company traditional r and d this is a at least one year project and this type of startup agile light technology it it's a bit over uh, over one month from start to to execution and implementation second example as well that there's a machine vision based quality assurance solution for a global uh, steel company uh, how to identify these uh, small holes uh, scratches and then then to compare that with sort of a correlative data uh, then to get then to get the insights and I I'm at least I'm really thrilled about this sort of a light technology that how it improves the whole whole production whole operations with sort of a with very uh, rapid development thank you thanks Mirko very very interesting uh, points I would say later to discuss also with the I mean, definitely with uh, the other the other experts and panelists. So now is um, uh, the turn for uh, Mr. Marco Moritati. He is the co-CEO for uh, a company based in Italy called Moto Soprandi, uh, which is uh, active in uh, robotics. So uh, let now Mr. Marco to start the presentation. Hello, my name is Marco Moritati. I'm an informatic engineer. I'm CEO of Moto Soprandi. And um, I'm going to present our concept of smart robot motion because uh, Motosu Brandi is an innovative AI cloud robotics company. We were established in uh, 2017 in Hong Kong and we provide software solution to optimize industrial robots. Uh, so we are focusing on smart motion for robotic cars in the manufacturing industries, basically. And we're, our technology is uh, in uh, line with Made in China 2025 and Industry 4.0. Uh, what's the problem? And, um, every manufacturer's company need to stay competitive in the market, of course, so they have to cut every year the cost uh, that basically is brought by the, the rising of the cost of the energy, of the materials, uh, and they also need to face the challenge of sustainability because every year um, a huge amount of new robots uh, are dropped in, in the market. Um, so uh, what, what we do basically, uh, we like to explain uh, the, our solution by an analogy. Um, if you know, um, not long time ago, people used to use the paper map to find the best path to move from a point A to a point B. Then they realize to the GPS technology that optimize uh, the, the path. We do the same with the robot arms and um, with a smart technology. Uh, we find the best path um, uh, to um, optimize um, the motion. 
as you can see in this uh, 3D video, uh, we have uh, uh, the orange line path, that is the uh, path um, uh, optimized by human. Uh, this is the project we made uh, with uh, Foresia, it's a French manufacturer company. And the um, uh, light blue one is the one optimized by Motus software. And uh, as you can see, um, the difference between the two paths, and there is a curiosity in this moment uh, when the arm uh, goes over the object to move and not goes around. And uh, this is uh, pretty curious, but with this uh, improvement, uh, we're able to reduce the consumption up to 40%. And this is uh, done by our software and um, in a, in a very simple way. Um, so the four main benefits that our software um, technology, our technology gives is the um, a huge reduction of energy consumption, um, an increase of productivity, basically in speed, um, an increase of the lifetime of the robots, and this uh, uh, helps to the, to the um, challenge uh, of sustainability. And of course, uh, we reduce the maintenance and engineering time. And uh, Motus uh, is able to measure the energy consumption before and after the optimization. And um, uh, this skill, uh, um, many platform hasn't shown, so they don't know how much energy they are con consuming. This is a small overview of our attraction. Of course, we have partnership with uh, some uh, incubators like Spend, uh, Interweekend, Hub, uh, suppliers like Senate, uh, Schneider Electrics, and uh, basically um, our um, projects are focused in the uh, robotic arms in automotive uh, field. So we have a uh, pilot project with uh, General Motors, uh, Volvo, and uh, at this moment with the uh, Dleminer Benz. Um, just uh, an overview of the market. Um, at the moment, we have uh, quite 3 million industrial robots in the market. They uh, point to be um, 100 million. And, and basically, the, most of them are based in, in China and in the auto, automotive market. So this is the market where our solution basically plays. That's all. Perfect. Thank you, Marco. That's for you. Interesting point also here. So thank you very much for your introduction. Um, while you were uh, talking, I took some notes. Uh, just uh, just a few key words that I that I heard and captured, uh, which I would like to use uh, to, to to spark now the the discussion regarding. Uh, I would say also a little bit of clarification of what you have introduced, but definitely to start now into what could be now the, the, the developments and what could be the, the visions on this uh, machine learning application. From the introduction of uh, Lorenzo, I could understood uh, a very clear uh, message that uh, no matter you know how good uh, your models and uh, numerical uh, systems are, uh, if you don't know your process in the end, uh, <laughs> you're ending up with something strange. So, you know, you, you better keep together these two things always at the same time, which is something which I personally like very much and I apply uh, definitely in, in, all the, in all the things uh, my, in my company we, we do. From the, from the presentation uh, of, um, of uh, Charles, I, I, I could understand something regarding value. So, I mean, you know, you are dealing with uh, with, uh, with, uh, with trash, but of course, because we know that in a circular economy model, there is value there. So if you, if you destroy this value, basically <laughs> before it has been created, uh, you know, you are basically out. So you, you have to really, you know, keep this value, actually try to improve it, increase it. So this is uh, what, uh, what came to my, to my attention. From the presentation of Jason, uh, uh, I could understand a clear message regarding quality. So um, the applications you are uh, you are developing and the direction where you are going is uh, targeting quality. So you want to you want to improve the quality of your products, the, the, the quality of your manufacturing, and uh, give really this kind of value to, to your clients. From uh, from Miko, I have something regarding interconnectivity. Um, which is also another, another, let me say, topic, another situation which, uh, which definitely requires a lot of, at of attention when you are uh, deploying machine learning models, because in the end, uh, you know, you need to put together a lot of things. 
So if your if if your connectivity in you know it doesn't work, uh, it doesn't mean that you don't receive the signal, but really you are not able to elaborate the inputs and send back the, the outputs. In the end, uh, uh, your models will not will not deliver what they are what they are supposed to. And uh, from the presentation of, uh, of of Marco, I I could really see a clear message regarding. You know, you use the robot because you want to be competitive, and you, you use the robot because you know you really want to want to save, uh, and you want to look for all the areas where there is, let me say, some hidden value again, <laughs> and uh, you want to you want to take it out because you know uh, in the end we know that uh, if we keep doing things in the same way, we will always end up at the same point. So if we want to go further, you know, we need to we need to look for uh, for a new route. And uh, definitely, it seems that uh, your model can uh, can help us uh, going there. So, um, as a point of discussion, I would like to uh, to use now um, because in the heavy industry, uh, we have been uh, always uh, involved in automation. Um, and today, when I personally go and meet clients and you know talk about uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, you know, usually there is a little bit of confusion. Of course, there's a little bit. Uh, of uh, um, uh, doubts uh, how the AI and machine learning can uh, can help, um, but I really see that uh, you know clients they think that that AI is like a development of the, of uh, the automation, uh, which I don't see. It. I mean, in, in my opinion, it's 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 a different layer, but it's also a different dimension. So I would like to know from you what is what is your experience and and how do you do you approach this kind of situation, and um, and what is the uh, what is the feeling of the um, of, of your customers, Lorenz? Well, this this is in, in, in the last uh, few years it's, it's growing up this problem because uh, because they had, here in Germany we have this Industry 4.0 technology where they they have the main idea that you could integrate this always in the level one so without having an an, an intelligence and level two so they think. We, we often see customers tell the way I want to do this in a PLC, for example, such strange ideas we, we got sometimes because and, and we have also some some clients which were, were work together and we said they think they want to do it there. But if you if you look at this, at the, the layer which we had 20 years before, they make still sense, even if you have the artificial intelligence or machine learning cases in that part, because um, some information are always starting from the level four going down to the level three and having a look at this part having a plant-wide look not only at the special part of the machine then you can try an optimization which helps you much more in in that case you still have some some parts for example if you make a sorting algorithm or make some some visualization for then is an IE is only local but the main focus where we work is is the the part where we try to optimize not only one aggregate but also shop floor wide in that case and then you need a level which is surely much above than the level one or in, in the low level it depends on the work but the the customer are mixing more and more so this this is still a problem because on the other hand they you have customer who tells us Oh, it's all too complicated. I'm putting here, yeah, I don't need it. Or you, I need a, a bottle, um, a box completely, a black box, which I don't have to customize. If you have to, um, to customize or you have to to support it, which more, then it got difficult. If you have a product which is finished in that case, then you can use it. Otherwise, it gets tough. <laughs> Understood. Very clear. Charles. What is uh, what is your experience when uh, when you when you tell clients about uh, augmenting uh, the capacity of automation with uh, AI? Yeah, it's a uh, it's a really interesting question. So um, you know, clean robotics plays kind of in a different uh, uh, you know I think vertical than maybe some of the other panelists. So we're we're marketing our technology to 
public facing high traffic locations like international airports, uh, mm -hmm. stadiums, arenas, malls, universities, and so forth. And in those settings, uh, particularly when it comes to solid waste, the experts that we're talking to within an organization understand that the public is very bad at sorting waste. Um, you know, in the United States, for example, choosing between just two bins, landfill and recycling, uh, the public is less accurate than chance, about 30% is, is what we project. Uh, and, you know, this is after decades and decades, maybe 60, 70 years of public facing education on the importance of recycling and waste sorting and how to do it and people still can't get it. So from that point of view, it's very clear uh, that it's a, it's a, it's a situation that is um, almost perfectly designed for automation. There's very little reward for the public to do things right. There's no feedback on whether they're doing it correctly, and then consequently, there's there's no incremental improvement to be had on on any of the methods. So they they kind of very quickly appreciate how um, artificial intelligence, computer vision, and robotics can help with that particular problem. Uh, but then there are a lot of questions within the organization about how the system actually works. Um, how is it getting better? Um, how do humans interact with it? Um, what uh, types of maintenance uh, and um, other types of requirements and upkeep is kind of goes hand in hand with the technology. And there's a lot of education that we have to do. Uh, you know, uh, waste receptacles haven't changed a whole lot, right? The, our biggest competitor are solid steel tubes. And all of a sudden we're coming into the picture with robotics, computer vision, data, uh, cellular connectivity, and so forth. And so there's, there's quite a bit of education that, that has to take place for us to, uh, to move forward on any particular project. Yeah, I mean, you can make it foolproof, but in the end, there is always, uh, let's say, some uh, expertise that required a certain point Again, not to not to destroy the value which has been created, right? Correct. Correct. Okay, Jason, what uh, what, is, uh, what is your experience? You you are like me in China, so uh, <laughs> have, uh, have another dimension of uh, experience, I believe. Yeah, I think uh, I think Rollins. I totally agree, Rollins. Also, uh, uh, and yes, but also in China is a very very uh, special market. You know, in China we always talk intelligent solution, but I think ninety more than ninety percent we are talk talk high level automations. Yeah, we talk intelligent solution, but I think ninety percent we are talk high level automation. So. Normally in China, so if, we, if we want to talk to customer, okay, whatever they call, what's the name, some other solution, intelligent solution, but I think, uh, how to say, AI or, or machine learning also can support is a high level, uh, this uh, Chinese, uh, we call China manufacturer 2025. So when I go to customers, so well, okay, we are also how, as they try to convince customer, okay, what is the difference? What is the automation? And what is this oven like computing visions and also like uh, data mining? So, so how can you use this the computer vision and the data mining or machine learning to support the basic automations? So if we want to talk to customers, so we will always use, you know, we should use always use try to use the customer language to support and help them understand what are we talking. So in, if especially for Chinese customers, really sometimes I would say you want to talk very, very uh, theories, nobody understand it. So we, we just give them or get, you create some scenarios. Okay, like uh, just I mentioned in my in my presentation, like a uh, automatic uh, scraper clarifications. So we need you know total length, what's the result? What's the benefit of, of you can get from this like the uh, computer visions? So I think it's easy for them. So I think it's a long way to go. We need to really need to take a long time to educate a customer to identify what is what is AI, what is the basic automation. But uh, anyhow, basic automation and uh, intelligent solution, all this is a machine learning is a linked. It's not a separate. It's a, with the fact based on these basic automations. That's it. Correct. Thank you so much, Miko. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I think well, after seeing in the last couple of years let's say over 100 different type of customers and 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 another 100 vendors across the globe i think the future is future is rather clear that how there's a convergence or integration of automation systems artificial intelligence machine learning and then same time sort of the cloud edge technologies that that because there's this sort of a whole, holy grail of this autonomous operation. What, what seems to be, I mean, many have that 
that idea that we would like to move how to have these autonomous operations on plant level and in sort of sub areas and up up into sort of a value chain optimization. But then it's it's much more difficult to to define the timeline that when all of these things will happen because it's sort of a gradual, not revolutionary development. It's it's a evolution that how these things go hand in hand and e eventually these all are yeah, all are I I integrated. That we have these uh, learning processes on system level and production level and in the whole plant. Marco, I think you have a hard life when you are telling people I have put the robot and I replace a worker, right? <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, the, the problem is like this because uh, the word uh, artificial intelligence uh, became a fashionate word. Uh, everybody uh, sometimes they're pretty frightened of this word. And uh, but when uh, you explain that maybe you can save a lot of money, they they say they're sold. And but another point is uh, that you said that if, uh, the fear that, that, that you can can be substituted when the point is with artificial intelligence, we can help humans to work better because of uh, the many advantages they, 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 they can bring. And uh, it's another challenge to, 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 to make people, to make customers understand to, to invest money in these new technologies. Uh, but but uh, we will we won we'll win the, this challenge. Understood. Thank you so much. So um, I wanted to ask now a little bit of random question, but of course uh, uh, feel free also to uh, to bring some other question and topic to to this discussion. Um, I was um, browsing the uh, website of Advian, Nico, and uh, I saw this uh, statement saying uh, unfair competitive advantage. <laughs> so I was a little bit curious, I said, but you know, usually, <laughs> you know, you always give like positive messages and not, uh, let's say, something like, uh, I'm going to make you clever, right? So what does, what does that, what does that mean, please? Unfair advantage means that how to have a team at your side, who is, because there are so many companies, so many attempts and so much because it's so much in fashion, this whole artificial intelligence, that there's so many projects are that we, we, we would like to still, we are in the world that so many companies, they have just this idea that we would like to do something with artificial intelligence. We would like to explore something with machine learning. And, and then you have have sort of a variation that, that if you precisely know that what is the problem and, and you have assigned team both from the hardware side and software side and sort of the a a analytics that how you combine these that you have this type of team at your side and not just someone who who would like to do and can do artificial intelligence but not with sort of a precise competence from these problem areas okay okay and this is Thank you. Thank you for uh, for your explanation. Um, so, Lorenzo, where uh, where do you see um, your uh, AI and uh, machine learning application going to? You? Uh, if you can tell us, okay. Of course, we don't want you to disclose. Strategic <laughs> secret. <laughs> you know, well, what I would like what, to have a little bit of a flavor. <laughs> okay, good. What what we see here is that um, here in, in Germany, what is a very big theme is it's the secular recycling in that case. So, and we try to to see how we could use this this different part to reintegrate the ideas in the heavy industry. So, um, it's a, they, they got very interesting ideas because they must be very flexible in this case. You have a combination of different um, optimization problems there, which you have to handle there. And um, if you ask me for a special algorithm, I would say, or for a special technology, 
I would say, I don't know, it will change. <laughs> we got always very old ideas, which goes up again. And I remember so often things that I studied 30 years ago and always told me, oh, this is dead. And now they're coming back with new names. So I I will be very surprised what will come. But um, the main idea is that uh, when you, you look at the neuroinformatic, what, what I studied 35 years ago, they have the, the main ideas are, are still there and what's going on here we got very much faster computers so you could handle much more what what wasn't possible when i remember that when i started as uh, my, my first neural project was prometheus at uh, with the volkswagen in, in i don't know how many years ago it is we had very very scarce resources to to handle and to make it and to try it online and if you look what you have now it is, um, I think the algorithm are there, but you got much more power and uh, what you could handle just now in clouds is just very interesting. So I don't think that we need much more new technologies, but uh, maybe a combination of, of suffering mm -hmm. parts. So that, that will be in that case and combining more and looking at the different way will be the most important thing because the, the, the main ideas are there, but looking there from another side is that what, what could help. Understood. Um, very, very interesting. Very, very interesting point. Thank you very much. Charles, what do you yeah, see in the, the future of RML? That's a really interesting question. So, um, you know, when I think about um, machine learning and AI, I also tend to pair it, at least in my mind, with robotics because we, we have a robot. Uh, and in general, I look for applications where, uh, you know, the job is dirty, dull, and dangerous, and that's kind of like the sweet spot for robotic application. One thing that I'm thinking a lot about from a robotics and an AI point of view is increasing decentralization. Uh, Lorenzo mentioned, you know, the, the uh, proliferation of, you know, much more powerful computers, but I think something that goes hand in hand with that is the reduction in costs and these types of computational uh, platforms as well as sensor bases and so on. And so that that kind of market shift allows technologies like ours uh, to proliferate. And it also opens up new opportunities for the application and you know new news cases, uh, use cases. So you know I think of our company as a uh, data and a software company disguised as a hardware company or disguised as a robotic company. And if you look at it like that, now you have the opportunity to start applying AI systems, machine learning systems, uh, as data collection platforms in a variety of use cases. Uh, and I think that's that's kind of the future. Um, another kind of commonly used term for this type of vision is IoT, the Internet of Things, but you can add a intelligent layer over that um, using AI uh, and, and artificial intelligence. Okay, understood, very, very clear. So data and, uh, and algorithms to, to move on. Thank you so much. Jason. <clears throat> okay, okay, well, I'm talking for application of related AI or machine learning. So, uh, because we are always a lot of discussion with customers, so my uh, personal proposal is that we should sometimes we need to sit in customer side in lab position to think about AI or machine learning, how can support them. Because a lot of these, uh, our, um, whatever is on partners or on um, partners or similar like I'm suppliers, we are always thinking uh, what a product, what a developer fantastic product. But sometimes we didn't sit in custom side to think about what I want. So sometimes when we are like when I work for my uh, previous companies, like developer fantastic like quality prediction systems. But when when can come go to the market, and um, it looks like it's not really suitable for this market. So sometimes, I, I, my personal idea is that we should some a lot of discussion, need a discussion with customer, and sit in last side, sit in last side, okay, to think about how can support me, support the customer to optimize the operation cost, how can optimize the process, how to how how to include uh, make a, a better quality, something like this. Then I think AI or machine learning. Can maybe a big have a, a a big different or a popular in in this market. This is my idea. Very very interesting uh, answer. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Nico. Yeah, I was just thinking when hearing the what others were saying that I think what we all would agree that the 
there's so much technology already existed there, how to get the data out from something. Then we have the algorithms that have been there for decades. I think the near term biggest change that we are able to get benefit, how how we people, how do we how, how do we accept these things and how do we really take advantage of these things? Because we are talking about companies that has existed 100 years and there's a lot of heritage in the companies and how how things are done and how different professions are show their professionalists in different sort of a, a, a working roles. So I, I think think the biggest next steps will be that how we as people we are able to adapt and how we are able to utilize what is already at the moment available out there. Okay, so for you is more uh, more a question of let me say efficiency, right? So we have more than we will need, and uh, actually we should first exploit what we have, and then we can move to. Yeah, to sort of that that how we how we people that we accept that we how we can be more curious what can be done. We can be more sort of out of the box, and we can act, we need to accept that certain things will replace human brains and and this, but it's. But it doesn't happen overnight. But still, I think there's so much resistance from us people that yes, that's all that everything is available there. But still, we have this that doubts that will it work in my company or will it work in this environment? So it's I think it's a we people we need to uh, develop more at the moment. Thank you, Marco. Yes, um, I think that uh, Motus is the the youngest company in Spain. We we established uh, just a few years ago. In, in between, there was also the pandemic, so we have to do a lot of work of research and development. Um, and also, if you consider the jump of the numbers of uh, robot, uh, um, as I said before, from three millions to one hundred millions, this is a fact that we have to manage. Um, uh, and an important thing is also to to have a look at um, uh, to the sustainability of this thing, to to the reduction of, of energy consumption of of, of uh, the, the the planet resources because uh, time is an hurry and then we have to, to, to focus this. I think there's um, a sort of a change of paradigm um, uh, in front of the first uh, um, industrial revolution um, of many years ago. So the challenge is we want to develop, we want to do more, but we have uh, also to uh, not stress uh, the, the plant resources, uh, not substitute uh, people. And so um, there's, there's a lot of things to do in, in research. Yeah, certainly, exactly. So it'll be also interesting to know about the life cycle of a robot at this point, because I remember when uh, when the big wave uh, of the renewable energy came and uh, they put a lot of wind turbines here and there, everybody was happy. Somebody was complaining about uh, you know the the, uh, the big spot on the landscapes and so on. But uh, it seems that it's becoming now an issue in many countries, especially I read about the U.S. a few months back that all the blades up of these turbines, when they are at the end of their of their life cycle, they don't know where to put them because yeah. nobody thought about how to recycle them. So they are going to fill lands here and there. So I hope that with the robots will not happen the same and <laughs> we will have yeah. cemeteries of robots in a uh, in few years uh, yeah. instead of having, uh, let's say, centers where you can revamp uh, and uh, you can, uh, let's say, reprogram your robot, uh, you know, for, for yes. your life, right? <laughs> And also about uh, energy consumption, because uh, we noticed that uh, at the moment they don't know how much energy uh, the, the robots um, uh, is consuming uh, until they not receive the bill. And this is not acceptable. Um, our software do, do, do this. Our software is able to, to measure uh, how much energy the robot is, is consuming uh, doing its work. Yeah, at least in the first place, and then uh, you have, you get the actuals, and then you compare the <laughs> the delta. Of right, course. exactly. Um, just to utilize the last few 
the last few minutes of the panel. Um, is there any topic or any question each of you would like to ask uh, somebody else or ask me, for example? Um, please, up to you. The stage is yours. So the topics, uh, the topics which we had, uh, of course, uh, recently has been always about you know the COVID people who no travel, and uh, so we had to you know move to, to a new normal, uh, new normal life. So we had to do a lot of uh, uh, telcos from home, and um, we had to think also about how to, to get others to work uh, and uh, and think about uh, you know how to move goods around uh, and. So a lot of a lot of topics, a lot of things which we have uh, we have thought over uh, in the last uh, I would say 16 to <laughs> 17 months. Um, so I think there are there are a lot of things where you know AI and ML they can uh, they can jump in. So I I I fully <laughs> let's say align my my ideas with uh, with Miko saying uh, you know uh, yes vision could be basically to. <laughs> To try to utilize what we already have, uh, you know, and uh, find other gaps, you know. So this uh, this can be definitely the, the the way to go. I have a quick question for Marco. Yes, so um, uh, something that is uh, that we talk a lot about at Clean Robotics, uh, in particular with our clients, is obviously we're counting every item of waste that goes through our system, and we have some benchmarks and rules of thumb about. If you're able to divert, for example, one ton of recyclables, that is equivalent to five tons of CO2 that's abated. And we find that with our customers that that resonates very strongly, you know, not just the solid waste implications, but also the carbon abatement implications. Obviously, with the energy savings that you're, you're able to generate um, with your algorithm, uh, I think that's a very direct kind of line. Uh, do you find any interest around circularity, carbon abatement, uh, and just uh, the sustainable aspects of the energy efficiency, uh, efficiencies? Does that resonate with your client base as well? Uh, yes, um, as I said before, uh, the sustainability uh, is one of the challenges we have to face. Of course, the, the, the most important aspect is, 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 uh, is, the, is the one of the, the energy um, saving uh, in terms of money for the company. Uh, this is the, 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 the most important, important aspect they look at. And we are trying, as, as I said before, to, to educate also the customers in this way. Okay, very good. Um, so, if there are no other points, I think we can uh, we can wrap up the, the 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 discussion here. And I would like to thank you very much, all of you, Lorenzo, Charles, Jason, Nico, and Marco. Uh, your contribution has been definitely outstanding, and um, I look forward to uh, develop some of the topics uh, together. Or so we can also, of course, uh, uh, cross also among you. And um, I look forward to to get more and more insights. Thank you very much, and you all stay safe. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Karan. Thank, Thank, Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye